Okay, good, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to this uh, Brownback seminar. Uh, this is the first seminar in a, in a whole series where we try to uh, to have everybody um, to, have a, to, to have everybody from different angles of all the work in Latin America presenting. So if there's more candidates to do Brownback seminars, there's still many days open. Uh, so any uh, additional candidate, actually Tanya will be giving a Brownback seminar this 26th of April. Uh, so that's next week. That one will be in Spanish, I think. Uh, uh, that one is called Extensionismo, Asistencia Técnica y Impacto en la Producción, it, uh, and it will talk about the experience in Central Highlands. Today, I have the honor and the great pleasure to introduce uh, Ravi Gopal Singh. Ravi uh, has been working uh, on sustainable intensification questions, uh, I would say, his uh, whole career. He uh, was with the um, famous and infamous Rice Wheat uh, Consortium. Uh, doing uh, excellent work, and I had the, the honor of visiting during my PhD several of his uh, trials there. Then he worked with our great friends from uh, ICARDA for, uh, uh, quite, for quite a substantial time in the Indian national system, and today he supports the different hubs uh, with uh, technical backstopping and the generation of new technologies. And his seminar today is, then, then is therefore called Agriculture in Mexico, Challenges and Opportunities, which summarizes the, I think now more than a year experience traveling all over Mexico from an outside view. So Ravi, the floor is yours. Uh, just for everybody, the seminars are also transmitted by webinar. Uh, so we have uh, six people connected, maybe more will come up and are transmitted in the local offices of, of, of CIMIT. So we have more people watching. That's why when we ask questions, if you can use a microphone so those people can also follow. Thank you very much, uh, Bram, for introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I came here in September 2015, so not much experience, but try to share what I have seen, what uh, I perceive uh, with my experience, previous experience working with RWC and other organizations. As you know, Mexico with about 130 million uh, population, uh, only 14% uh, living in villages, uh, about 26 uh, million people. Uh, it's one of the most diverse uh, country uh, with respect to agriculture I have ever seen. Uh, uh, it has uh, uh, from auto consumer to commercial agriculture, from uh, very, very dry desert to very high rainfall, from lower uh, uh, altitude to high altitude. And the uh, average rainfall, uh, as I, you can see here, is about 758 uh, millimeters per year, about 20, uh, 14 million hectare area cultivated every year, and out of that, uh, 5 million hectare irrigated. And uh, so uh, most of the north and uh, northwest part of the country is dry, very dry, whereas the agriculture activities are in the down southern and central part. Northern part, agriculture is supported by agriculture, about 5 million hectare area irrigated, uh, about 70, 71 kilogram of uh, fertilizer consumed per hectare, uh, 7 million hectare of maize being the, uh, the main important crop. Most of the farm are about half of the farmers in Mexico are small, uh, cultivating less than uh, 5 hectare land with uh, least external inputs uh, and under very difficult conditions sometimes on slopey terrains. Uh, now the agriculture area today is uh, considered about uh, uh, 14 uh, million hectare, out of which 10 million hectare is cereals. Uh, out of the cereals, 7 million hectare is maize, 2 million hectare is sorghum, less than 1 million hectare is, uh, is wheat. So mainly cereal-based systems that uh, makes the agriculture a little bit more challenging uh, and especially with maize because it's uh, one of the erosion permitting crop and mostly cultivated 
on slopey terrains where erosion is a big problem. Productivity per se for the cereals is about 3.6 uh, tons per hectare and for beans and other legumes is less than a ton per hectare. Maize uh, is still, uh, we are not able to reach self-sufficiency. Last year, the maize import was about 9 million tons, which keep on fluctuating, mainly the yellow maize. Uh, agriculture offers about 14% employment about 3% to levies, uh, and as I said, the nutrient use is 71 kilogram, and government spending in agriculture is slowly, slowly going down. In 1961, it was about 13%, now it's about 3% only. So agriculture is probably no more the most favored uh, enterprise by the government. If we take up, think, talk about the crops, uh, the highest productivity is with wheat about 5 ton, followed by sorghum about 4 ton per hectare, followed by maize 3.3 ton per hectare, and so on with other crops uh, uh, about 1 or uh, 2 tons per hectare. Uh, but the highest area goes with maize, which is followed by sorghum, bean, wheat, barley, soya. Uh, chickpeas, a little bit of lentils also. Uh, challenges wise, uh, I, I, I think uh, from my point of view, monocropping is biggest challenge, which is also an opportunity, of course. Uh, we see in rain fed mainly maize and then in irrigated uh, ecologies, cereal uh, systems. In some cases, it's uh, a wheat followed by sorghum. For example, in whole of the Bahio or, or wheat uh, followed by sorghum or any other crop in Yaki Valley, wheat fol followed of uh, one crop of wheat in Mexicali. So, in irrigated ecology is mainly severe systems. The second problem which we see uh, very important is the availability of varieties and which can be segregated into two parts. One is private sector preferred crops, which is hybrid mage, hybrid sorghum, where private sector is uh, pushing their hybrids mainly into intensive agricultural areas. So the large track of farmers in uh, large area of the farmer farming in southern part of Mexico or the central part of Mexico, rain fed ecology is not receiving those hybrids. So they largely depend on criollos my maize and my my soil, mi tierra, mi maize. That is that that is kind of emotional emotional bonding with the crops. On top of uh, uh, limited extension activities, is not able to 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 provide uh, varieties, especially with the non-private sector preferred crop. For example, wheat. For example, barley. For example, uh, beans and so on. Barley, one of the most important varieties is Smeralda, which was released about 40 years ago. And similarly, in, in, in Yaqui Valley or in Bahio, we see new varieties, but in southern part of Mexico, farmers are still using very, very old varieties, even some varieties, materials that were brought by Spaniels, uh, the Spanish people. Uh, Agronomy, agronomy point of view is still not very clear cut recommendations coming out uh, in different regions. So you can see in Sinaloa, farmers are using about 400 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, but almost no limited amount of phosphorus and no potassium. I was in, in Salaya, farmers are using about 400 kilograms or 300 kilograms wheat seed per hectare, which should range, should be about 150 or 100 kilograms is sufficient in the trials, but farmers are using similarly huge discrepancy in the use of nutrients and uh, seed and inputs, not very clear cut recommendations coming out that are being adopted on the ground. So that I see one of the, the, the issue. Weed management, probably the third most important uh, problem that farmers are facing. 
and I also see some, some of the key issues uh, inappropriate herbicide mixture. I see uh, in time, uh, untimely application of uh, uh, the control measures, and especially uh, huge pressure from private sector to push chemicals rather than a non chemical or cultural or integrated weed management here, which means it's a costly and it's still not, not effective. <laughs> So erosion uh, is, is an issue, and apart from erosion, the other degradation, uh, decreasing carbon, uh, carbon sector, organic matter sector, and uh, there are other uh, issues, uh, mainly socioeconomic availability of market. There is no market available so far for the most of the commodities, except for yellow maize with some standards. So farmers are uh, facing this problem uh, for selling the maize at uh, three, 3 peso per kg or 4 peso per kg or some that's uh, one of the problem and not 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 availability of credit subsidies agriculture in some part is subsidized but this subsidy is sometimes helpful sometimes not i can give you an example for example in chia farms farmers use Diamond in phosphate, phosphate, mainly phosphate fertilizer with nitrogen and equipment. And they don't use uh, any nitrogenous fertilizer. So, because DAP is subsidized, the, if one herbicide is subsidized, the farmers will use the same herbicide no matter whatever uh, the requirement, whatever the problem is. So, so at some, some places, uh, these subsidies are helpful, at some places it is not. And similarly, I see a little bit lack of coordination between INIFA uh, extension and research system. And uh, therefore, the good research that is available with the researchers uh, is not uh, reaching to the, to the farmers, especially by small and marginal farmers. Similarly, some policy issues uh, with respect to land and water uh, and investment. As I said, the investment in the agriculture is going down and the external policies. Sometimes there is some export, sometimes not. And uh, especially in commercial agriculture, a lot of commodities are being produced for export. I mean, for example, in Sinaloa, in, in, in Yaki Valley, we see that. It is uh, also uh, an issue of climate change uh, and uh, uh, agricultural area and non-agricultural uh, sources of uh, global uh, warming uh, are, uh, are, are uh, very, you know, active here. So it, and one of the reasons that somewhere in 1700, the total cultivated area in Mexico would have been about less than half million hectares and today, at least at 14 million hectares. And so what we, we have the projections that temperature is likely to, to rise uh, and uh, uh, by 2% even, and there will be some reduction of, uh, of uh, precipitation. Uh, as you can see, 15% in central Mexico and 5% in Gulf of Mexico, and some agriculture then may become uh, unsuitable for agriculture. And the worst, the coastal uh, areas will be worst uh, affected. One of the important reasons for this kind of problems, uh, degradation, is, is, is uh, uh, converting land use from forest, which we see very strongly in Yucatan, in Shiapa, in all these places. You can see something like this. The farmers are selling to cutting uh, forest to grow crops. And this kind of phenomena can reduce uh, the soil carbon stock up to 40, 42%, which is a phenomena very common we see in the high of Mexico. This, this can be reversed, but uh, once they start cutting, it's, uh, we don't see much of uh, the opportunity uh, to going back to afforestation. 
Similarly, in, in, in a small farm, the auto consumer, there are specific issues related to monocropping, varieties, as I said. Planting density is often uh, considered as one of the most limiting uh, factors for maize uh, productivity in these uh, small farms. And this is hand planted male maize, and uh, uh, they make holes and put three to four seeds per hole, and uh, uh, that is considered as uh, one of the limiting factors. Similarly, almost uh, no fertilizer is used. Uh, I want to tell you that out of 14 million hectares uh, of agriculture, adequate fertilizer is applied to 2 million hectares. And uh, 4 million hectares area receives some fertilizer which is not present. Uh, so about 7 million hectares area of, uh, of agricultural area in Mexico doesn't receive any fertilizer. So it's grown mainly on native fertility or some bulky organic manure. And so this is some of that uh, photograph of ecology of auto consume, uh, consumer where the maize, mainly maize is grown on a laderas or the slopey terrains. This is from Oaxaca. Wheat is being cultivated on a slopey terrains, uh, no residue conventional, very intensive tillage planted along the slope which permits soil erosion and degraded fertility. Uh, similarly, this is uh, from Chiapas. Uh, erosion has uh, removed uh, soil from the terrains and stones are coming out and the farmers are planting peanuts here. Uh, so this is something what we see in most of the uh, auto consumer uh, ecologies, soil erosion, monocropping, these are the lack of varieties, lack of agronomical practices emerge uh, is one uh, are the uh, are key issues. Uh, one of the traditional uh, way of growing crops, uh, a mixed crop system, which they call milpa, uh, where maize uh, is the main crop with bean and sometimes uh, calabasa, and so many other vegetables and fruit, as you can see here. Uh, so there is a big change in this uh, system up here. This is a kind of gloomy for uh, they were going to ask after cutting forest. Earlier this cycle was about 25 years. So forest for 15, 20 years of forest and two, three crop cycle, and then again, growing forest for 15 to 20 years. This cycle has reduced uh, later to, to 10 to 15 years. So 8 to 10 years of forest, 2 to 3 cycles, and then again 8 to 10 years of forest. But what has happened recently that this milpa system, the cycle has reduced to a greater extent of one year of crop and keeping it fallow. So it's prone to fertility uh, degradation. It's also prone to erosion and so many other stresses. Uh, similarly, if we look into the commercial agriculture, which I'm not very much interested in, but the uh, major issue here in commercial use uh, in agriculture is monocropping and increasing cost of production. Huge penetration of private sector. So they are selling, I don't know, how many types of uh, fertilizers. Some are clear, some we don't know what it contains. Organics, even manures. And so, a lot of use of external inputs, high production cost, and uh, inappropriate uh, agronomy that what we see, and also uh, degrading. Uh, soil fertility and factor productivity. This is a picture from Chiapas. Uh, maize system, irrigated maize, maize for, uh, for green crops. I don't know how many, 10 years, 20 years, this field, fields like these are receiving only one crop, that is maize. Similarly here, Mexicali, one crop is grown in this valley, 300,000. 150,000 hectares, which I don't see any other crop. 
been grown. And so wheat, 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 and then we have resistance uh, weed issues and several other similar. Sinaloa, one crop per year, maize, about 20% area in maize, 20% chickpea, wheat, and other crops. High planting density, 10,000 uh, plants per hectare. Very high use of nitrogenous fertilizer, limited use of phosphorus, no use of potassium. Uh, looking into the opportunities for sustainable intensification, I guess uh, we have a historical a book called Rig Veda wherein the rishis, uh, they started thinking of uh, this concept of managing agronomically and also managing natural resources for sustainable They say, which means good seed and good management of seed, which includes soil and, uh, and, 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 and other resources for prosperity. So uh, the sustainable agriculture has been defined, uh, as you know, is improving productivity, biomass from same unit, some, uh, unit uh, land and without having any negative impact on uh, environment. So there are three options available to improve productivity per unit area or increasing intensi uh, intensity or changing land use. And we also see some of these examples while uh, visiting the field. For example, in Highland, we see other crops Similarly, Yucatan beekeeping is integrated with the maize system. So, uh, it's a, on one hand, they have maize, sometimes soybean, but also uh, beekeeping. Why the yaki? Uh, about 200,000 hectares of wheat, and then in, 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 during winter and in summer, we have started growing, for example, last year, about uh, 50,000 hectares of soybeans, which makes the system more effective and uh, diversified. Similarly, we see uh, some level of diversification with chickpea, cartemo, and other uh, legumes being, for example, in Sinaloa. But these examples, as I, as I uh, have data, is at very limited scale. The steps which I think should be involved in sustainable diversif uh, intensification and diversification uh, includes assessment and uh, identification of issues, key issues, and entry points, integrated management solutions, not only for the crop, but also for natural resources. All of our previous work has been improving productivity using new varieties external inputs and, 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 and other economical packages for pest management and so on. But probably now it is time to think for, for example, lifting, funding, or, or growing cover crops, or reducing water use, producing more crop per unit of water, per unit of nutrients. So that part uh, needs to be integrated into crop management. The idea is to close get yield gap, but also to improve resource use efficiency, uh, whether it is a whether it is a fertilizer or herbicide or pesticide and whatever. But the ultimate goal is uh, trying to get sustainable yield growth at reduced production cost. We have some examples. We have uh, been trying into that. It's a 2015. In maize, a variety alone in, in Guanajuato, a variety alone can improve productivity from about 7 ton to 14 and a half ton. Similarly, in, in, in white maize in Guanajuato, this we conducted last uh, crop cycle in uh, Nanaka Milpa wheat, and some varieties are giving almost a ton and uh, more. This is Altiplano release variety, 
and uh, than the uh, release variety. So variety can play a major role in improving productivity. On natural resource management, there are set uh, principles which can be applied. For example, one of the recommendations for improving uh, soils uh, includes uh, keeping residues, reducing tillage, growing some kind of cover crops, which I see a big possibility here, and we are trying to find out the options, and crop rotation, uh, and so on. Uh, for example, drip irrigation, and which needs probably some policy intervention as well. Here is an example coming from D5, uh, a long-term experiment uh, which shows that reducing uh, tillage and keeping residue can not only give higher yield during good years, but also in, in dry years or bad years under rain fed ecologies. So obviously farmers are also not interested in the highest yield or very high yield. They want sustainable high yield so that they can manage their livelihoods in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better way. Nutrient management, as I said, one of the biggest issue we see in the country, especially, especially in, in rain-fed ecologies, not clear-cut guidelines. We were talking yesterday with Nila. Not, we, we don't have clear-cut guidelines. Which fertilizer, how much, and when. So still, we don't have clear-cut recommendations here, uh, and it depends mainly state to state, so still, still uh, uh, complicated. But we have some information that using same amount of nutrient in a enabling environment, for example, here, this bar shows zero kilogram nitrogen in conventional, zero kilogram nitrogen on permanent bed. You can see getting higher yield of same unit of nitrogen, same unit of fertilizer in a right environment, which I mentioned here. In some cases, if the pH is not uh, balanced or managed well, fertilizer is not going to help. If uh, drainage is a problem, fertilizer is not going to help. So we need to develop a more system-based nutrient management rather than crop-based or commodity-based nutrient management options. Similarly, uh, as I said, weeds is one of the major issues and we found that we need to, to think into more system-based approach, what crops, how crop rotations can be uh, important to, what fertilizer at what stage we can uh, you know that critical new uh, weed uh, Weed control uh, period is one of the most important uh, in formation for each crop for applying herbicide. We have seen that the private sector uh, is pushing a lot of herbicide. Sometimes they are compatible, sometimes they are not. Sometimes they are applied at right time, most of the time not. So farmer keep on applying one round, one, one, one shot, second shot, sometimes three shots in one crop, increasing, increasing uh, the cost of production without, without uh, good results. We have done some, last year we have done some trials and we found that, for example, in wheat, a herbicide combination of prosulfuran and thiosulfuran, which is called PK number, just uh, 20 grams per hectare, which cost us about 213 Mexican peso per hectare, can improve wheat yield from 3 ton, 3.5 ton to 5.6 ton per hectare. Similarly, 2,4-D, a very old herbicide, applied at the right time, which cost us. There are so many costly herbicides. We have applied about 15 of them, but we, we, we are uh, presenting here only those who are found most economical and most effective. From 3.5 ton to 5.6 ton, just by uh, uh, 
84 next time. So similarly in maize, uh, acetacloth, old herbicide, 400 Mexican peso per hectare can improve productivity about 10%. In beans, uh, very limited use of herbicide. Uh, so we found this inizathapir, uh, which is 30 gram per hectare, which cost us about uh, 262 Mexican peso can improve productivity by 22%. But then apart from all this uh, herbicide business, there are uh, much simpler ways to manage these, especially in, in, in rainfall and uh, conditions in small farms. For example, here, this is a picture from Zacatecas where it's, uh, this part is planted with the city area, it is full of uh, wheat planted of the Americana, but kind of pastos. 500 plants of Viragrostis per square meter. Very next to it is a sunflower. Not even a single Viragrostis. Not even a single. So crop rotation alone can fix a problem of uh, this kind of difficult weed. I want to tell you this weed, Viragrostis Americana, is causing to most of the new generation ALS and medical herbicides, which are expensive. The farmer is using an ALS inhibitor, he is going to get more erogenous mechana rather than using a sunflower in a cropping, crop rotation. Here, for example, again in Zacatecas, liming, just by using lime, agricultural uh, lime, which they call Calaricola. Four times per hectare not only improves uh, growth of uh, the mice, but also helps in reducing weed pressure. As, as you can see, weeds are more tolerant to soil acidity rather than uh, when they apply uh, in, in the, the cal, cal thing in acid soils, of course. Similarly, nutrient, uh, one of our technicians is trying to, uh, to, to reduce, to demonstrate that, uh, not, uh, not to use very really high amount of uh, fertilizer. And here you can see on this side is 150 kilogram nitrogen per hectare in three splits. And also here it's 240 kilogram, almost similar yield and similar growth. I also see a possibility of uh, deploying non-monetary inputs into which means selection of the crop variety, which means selection of the uh, uh, right time of planting, the right variety, the right planting density, and so on, can help a lot of improving productivity, which somehow is not reaching to the farmer. In intensive agriculture area, the private sector is tilting whole of the agriculture technology to external inputs. So they want to sell more foliar fertilizers. If you, if they, I mean, if in the name of organic they are selling, I don't know how many products. So the whole of the agriculture technology uh, that is going to the farmers is more monetary rather than non-monetary. And I strstrongly believe that non-monetary inputs can play a major role in improving productivity and sustainability than monetary. The effect of monetary input is short-lived so that farmers need to purchase it again and again, whereas non-monetary input can be used over a long period of time. One of this uh, example I'm trying to Depict here is the main system wherein farmers are planting whole seed at a distance of one meter by one meter. So now they make a hole, put four by seed, then again make a hole and put four by seed. So they get make about ten thousand holes per hectare, forty thousand, thirty to forty thousand plants per hectare. That is the most common way of planting in the highlands. Now, 
what we have uh, found that if they reduce hill to hill distance from one meter to half meter, keeping the road distance same one meter, the productivity can be increased by 50% by reducing uh, the plant to plant, the hill to hill distance, which means instead of making 10,000 poles per hectare, 20,000 poles per hectare, which is good, but I guess if I'm a farmer, if I have to make 20,000 poles per hectare, it's not easy from 10 to 20,000. So instead of doing that, and also it's a rainfed ecology, so the planting window is narrow, doing double job in the same window is not easy, rather than following a relay planting system wherein we plant maize, and after 15, 20, 30, 40 days, it can come again, make hold, and between four, four plants of maize, we can put uh, a bean or a kakahuate or, or, or any other non-cereal uh, crop or calabasa, whatever, that covers the ground. This is important because uh, maize is considered an erosion permitting crop, a crop that's planted at wide scale, which is even more wider in this case, uh, which permits, uh, 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 and planted during the PV season, which is uh, rainy season, which permits uh, soil erosion, and bringing uh, some kind of cover crop or legume will help in reducing, reducing uh, uh, erosion and improving fertility. Also, it may reduce some of the pest incidents, which has been uh, uh, experienced in other part of the world. Similarly, the cover crops can help a lot in reducing weed issues. So here, I would like to conclude with uh, we need system-based approach for uh, sustainable intensification rather than commodity use. So any technology package for crop, one crop is not going to help because maize in maize the whole system is different than the maize in maize wheat system. So we need a systems approach rather than commodity commodity centric approach. We also need to 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 work on simple package of practices which we are trying to do in massa growth through plate farm and uh, trials and modules. Uh, this is also important so that they can adapt it easily. Any complicated technology, for example, reducing hill to hill is not going to uh, to help help us, especially uh, when it's a labor intensive. Because labor availability for agriculture is is becoming uh, also an important uh, issue. Not many people, especially the young, are available anymore on the farm. Uh, Need-based technological of uh, packages and also farmer-to-farmer -farmer extension and uh, a system uh, which is which includes motivated technicians and uh, participatory research program which we are trying to do through mass agro and of course the self-sustained and driven by the farmers. Thank you very much. Um, Ravi, thanks for the presentation. I completely agree with you that we need to have a system approach to start solving a lot of the challenges that we have in Mexico. And um, one of my points is related with how do you arrive to these solutions that you are recommending that they are technical, but I will add that they should be also considered within a social, cultural, and economic context because uh, agriculture in Mexico is part of a wider, wider system, a livelihood system, in which there's a lot of trade-offs if you invest in one technology or in another one. So I will dare to say that when I think on system, I'm going more for the livelihood idea, that only to the farming system, but the farming system that considers these li livelihood strat strategies and how, um, um, how adapting one practice have in, in, in have in, in implications and trade-offs in the livelihood strategies of the farmers. 
one of these the issues that I have been discussing with farm with recently I was discussing with farm, some technical uh, extensionist technicals was this idea of how to arrive to these recommendations because um, any fab in the 1980s especially in 1990s they elaborate a lot of booklets and they, there's booklets about maize in every region of Mexico with a lot of recommendations of what what to do, how, when to sow, when to fertilize, when to harvest, and all that. I know that a lot of those booklets were focused more in the plot, in the idea of the, what you are calling the commodity-centric approach. But a lot of farmers questioned that they were useless because of one of the elements that you refer at the beginning, that is the heterogeneity. So what they were recommending on those bullets were not really adequate to, to the specific context of the farmers. And one of the issues that I was discussing with these farm advisors recently is that what was our adding value? It was the fact that we were coming with in technical recommendations for, for improving things or the skills that farm advisors have for finding the specific solutions pro well, to identify the specific problems and to find the specific solutions that each farmer has. And it comes for me a question about how much or what is the scale in which we have to, to create those um, recommendations domains. That for me it's a challenge by itself in an heterogeneous country like Mexico. I would like to, to listen to your opinion about this point. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I mean, very well said. A diverse country, limited markets, limited crops, limited options, several problems. That's how I characterize it. Veracruz, 2,200 millimeters of rain. Sonora, 250 millimeters. So we cannot generalize recommendations. So what we need, we need to work with the farmers. We also need to find technological solutions that are market friendly. When we go to the Valle Salto here, in one community, there is a market for Chicharo, for example. But if you travel 15 kilometers ahead, there is no market for chicharo. In one community, there is a market for aba. In one community, there is no market for aba. So recommendation for a larger reason may probably not work. And therefore, we need to use basic principles of agronomy or whatever you call it, agricultural sciences including economics, I mean, to develop region-specific simple package of practices that can be adapted. No recipe, sorry. I don't see any recipe. Especially for auto-consumer. For commercial, there could be. But for auto-consumer, no. It's a very much market-driven. It's very much household -driven. Because the, the idea is first to take care of the cow, take care of the sheep, forage, uh, household food security, and if there is a surplus, it will go to the market. So no, no recipe. We need to work with the, with the farmer. That is what the recipe is based on the principles of uh, sustainable intensification. If you guys want to add anything, Thank you. Uh, you mentioned, Doctor, um, cover crops to for the fertilizer problem we have here in Dias Altos. We have been trying the some cover crops in autumn, invierno, but uh, we feel we. We think that the farmers are not very uh, agree with the, with this kind of concept, 
in your visit, in the visits you had with my team uh, here in Valles Altos, what is the perception uh, you have about this point? Uh, you show us uh, maybe two weeks ago, uh, Nessa, you have here in Bataan, uh, but now I'm thinking this 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 year, uh, 2017, trying to put some of the of the best results you have in here in Bataan, but the answer, uh, maybe I'm kind of, I know the answer of the farmers, but I want you to tell me what would be the best way to approach this, yeah. this concept. Let us uh, understand the reality. And I characterize this whole cover crop issue into two major ecologies especially in rain-fed areas. One is the area where we have less than 500 millimeters of rain. Cover crop is going to create a competition for main crop and farmers may not accept it. But then there are areas where farmers are growing maize in 700, 800,000 millimeters of rain, one crop of maize, and there is some rainfall during OE when they are not growing a crop. At the same time, they have animal. Crop livestock interactions are very strong. Cover crop will only be adapted when it has some economic value. It has some use. Farmers are not going to plant cover crop if it affects the main crop or if it is not useful for their own consumption, for their forage, or for their own eating. So those are the basic uh, thumb rules uh, which we, uh, we may, may need to consider. But believe me, if monocropping is an issue, 7 million hectare of maize, 2 million hectare of, of sorghum, then probably somewhere we need to consider some option for diversification and cover crop is one of the simplest and easiest way to move forward, especially where livestock is integrated with the crops. We need to demonstrate probably. <coughs> Okay, thank you. I don't, know, maybe, I don't know if you wanted to answer there, but maybe I'll, I'll ask him a question in the same direction as well. So you, you're giving a, a big overview of uh, the issues, the constraints, the problems as well. Some of the problems have been around, I think, for 20 or 40 years, uh, rotation or, or weeds, etc. So my question is, what do you think is the role of SIMIT, looking at competitive advantage of SIMIT? And secondly, where do you see the role of, of partners and their competitive advantage to tackle some of these issues? So, I mean, the, the role of SIMIT is not only the technology development here, but the project is not a role where we are trying to the whole process of technology development and uh, that is, uh, that's what I said is self-sustained the program should be sustained by the technicians and the farmers themselves and Simic can play a role of catalyst into the whole problem and adoption. That's what I think. Uh, more than a question is more a comment on, on what you've been discussing. I think what is what I take away a lot here is that this is a piece in a system that that you're looking at and I think we are ready as a as a team, and we need to find out more who, where, to, to go beyond the fact it's a technology, but to go to more targeted, this targeting, but targeting that is not about, I'm a bit skeptical about recommendation domains. Uh, I would say it's more targeting to feed into decision making of, of farmers so that, that we understand what is the decision making from a technology point and what is the decision making from an adoption point in a system. And so, I mean, if, if, if if we look at the data that is being gathering and you combine what typology of farmers, typology of technologies, 
uh, and you combine those two into more the scenario tools that have been tried out, and I think Andrea will present in another in another space uh, in, one, in Guanajuato, where it's more about okay, which scenarios are driven by which technological intervention with which typology of a farmer, which the farmer knows best in the end, no? so he can put in the the parameters and take a decision on those scenarios. Then then we're getting close. Which for Marianne sensor to say what is the decision making on which research line you go on? I think we need to think a little bit more on how to back fuel that to, to, to all that. So now it's more a reflection than a question. Yeah, thanks, Ravi. Sometimes I want to demote myself and be more involved in those things. I mean, I think Mexico is an exciting country in terms yeah, of the, the diversity. Um, but we talked a bit about the, the targeting, but I think also what you have shown at the beginning that those systems are changing very rapidly in terms of uh, the social, socio-economic environments, and 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 the foresight. I think research should always think of tomorrow's problems to work on solution today. And I, I think the foresight is very important as well. I, I believe that in some systems, you know, in 20 years, I mean, you show the aging population, the percentage of the population involved in agriculture, and I think having some uh, geo geographically ex explicit uh, foresight on how those systems will likely evolve over the next 10, 15 years with strong drivers, which is, you know, off-farm employment uh, and, and other opportunities because, I mean, I like what Carolina said, you know, the role or the, the contribution of agriculture in livelihood may be very, very different. And again, I mean, if, if agriculture is more a cultural uh, value than really an economic value, Maybe intensification is not what you need to look at. We need to look at something else. And again, I, I believe that the, the, the environmental component will become more and more important also. So that's, but I really enjoy your presentation. I already talked about uh, perhaps trying to answer a little bit the question of Marianne of how we are identifying what technologies, what we have been documenting is that um, technologies um, are decided depending on the region as a part of a negotiation process that we have with local partners in which farmers are involved. So there are a lot of um, spaces are at hop level in which there is a discussion of what technologies or what is going to be tested, what is going to be tried, and those are shaping the fact that each hub has a different portfolio of technologies, that it's, um, it is really represent, representing the negotiation that, that CIMIT is having with regional, with regional partners and their interests, and in which farmers are involved. Perhaps at plot level that we have been collecting data, that, that things are very interesting and depends in the way that partners interact with farmers. In some, in some cases, we have been documenting that farmers are the ones who are deciding what to test. And farm advisors are only helping them in testing those technologies. In the case of, uh, in other cases, is the farm advisor who arrive with a diagnostic or are, are arrive sometimes even with a, the solution without really doing the assessment. So with this idea of HOP as an innovation network, we're bringing a lot of negotiation process in which a lot of things are not really enhanced of CIMIT, but uh, CIMIT is trying to create those spaces in which they arrive to specific things. So it is a little bit tricky because um, there's a, a great variety in which a technology is, is, it, it is practiced in, a, in that case in a model. No? In the case of platforms, I, uh, it's a little bit different, but in the case of what is tested and validated at farmers level, it's a negotiation process with different levels. No, I'm saying that when, when we think in the hub, the, the hub actors are involving farmers, farm advisors, even politicians, uh, all, all the people within CIMIT and out of CIMIT who are working in the pro program. With Ravi also? Yeah, <laughs> we, but a, a very big we. <laughs> You're referring to Marianne. I mean, I think the platform, for example, plays a crucial role in that decision making that you're referring to because it's a controlled. Exactly, it's a controlled environment there. 
which wealth or you get hundreds of ideas yeah and so I was just wondering are we really doing that in terms of the hundreds of ideas that we are hearing from the farmer and then how do we internally decide because I'm concerned uh, I mean in terms of like we have limited people all of you have limited time all of you are overworked all, all of you have far too high ambitions yeah so are we focusing our efforts in investment and time and ambitions at the right point where we have a high likeliness that it then really feeds into something that is viable with a substantive new number of farmers. And on the other hand, we also always need to take a little bit of risk because the point of research is not to bring in what farmers already know, but to bring in something new. And farmers automatically only talk with what they know. Yeah, I mean, they may have heard about something, but so I was just wondering whether we are really aligned in terms of how we are choosing this, or whether we have here quite different philosophy within CIMIT of how this should be done, and that would not be very helpful because then we scatter our efforts. I mean, we need to agree institutionally and use the competencies that we have within us and with partners to really agree how do we choose and invest our scarce time, efforts, and ambitions. The ambitions are never scarce. Uh, well, perhaps the last one. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Ravi, for your presentation. That was a really good overview. And uh, I have a more specific question, like regarding technology adoption. Uh, I'm wondering your opinion about, for instance, specifically about GreenSat. Like, uh, what is your opinion? What is your view? Why the poor adoption of GreenSat in such regions like Yaki Valley or Mexicali, where it's monocrop, and we know that farmers are washing their crops with nitrogen, and it's freely available. The, the tool is there online on the cloud. Farmers can access, farmers can use it, but there is a poor adoption of that. Like, what's your opinion on that, and how, how you think we, we could break this barrier regarding this specific point? I'm going, to, I'm going to use that question to say that Ivan is on the program to give a presentation August 24th. So I propose that we put that as one of the questions for his presentation. Uh, how do we turn technologies from a pilot phase that we know they work into, like, say, scaling? Uh, what is the business model for adoption? Which is probably a business model for commercialization is part of it, but there may be more. So more and more, and, and I, I use the term business models for adop I mean for adoption and scaling them for so what does that mean so we will put it on uh, on uh, Ivan's presentation and with that uh, Ravi thank you very much I think uh, it was worth you steered up the discussion and that was the idea of of this uh, space uh, and time to reflect a little bit so thank you and another round of applause